So now I go through and we talk about the uh, body systems, what's infected, what to use. Uh, and again, you kind of need to get an idea of what's likely to be there. And in urinary tract infections, uh, we can have gram positives or gram negatives. About 60 to 70 percent are E. coli in small animals, uh, with staph making up the majority of the rest, but you can have anything. But notice down here, we don't typically worry about obligate anaerobes. Obligate anaerobes are really, really rare in UTIs, so we don't have to have four quadrant coverage. Can it occur? Yeah. I had a, a mule foal that had a UTI. I did a urinalysis, saw the bacteria, active sediment, all that sort of thing, and put it on TMS, and it still had the UTI. And I get the, uh, the urinalysis back and it's say three plus bacteria. Well, one of the problems with urinalysis is that they just say three plus bacteria, that they'll tell you if it's rods, cocci, anything else. So I had them do a gram stain and it was gram positive rods. And it turned out that a particular foe had a clostridial pyelonephritis, really rare. We wound up doing a nephrectomy on, on that and cured it. Uh, <coughs> but that's one case in 35 years. Uh, so largely, we don't have to worry about our obligate anaerobes. So we're aimed uh, mostly at E. coli and staph. All right. And, and by the way, one of the things, this is not written down, but whenever you're deciding whether to treat a UTI and you can get your, your culture back and it's positive, uh, there's such a thing as asymptomatic bacteria. Uh, it is possible for the bladder to be invaded by bacteria that are not disease-causing. They seem to lack the fembri to attach to the cell to actually cause disease. So uh, one of the things you always do is you look for an active sediment. Now every year analysis is going to have a sediment. That's crystals and white cells and blood and so on and so forth. Uh, <coughs> but in a normal sediment there will be no white cells or blood or bacteria. An active sediment means one that has white cells, has blood, has bacteria, has debris. That's an active sediment. So always look to see if your urinalysis has an active sediment before you treat. If, it's, if they don't, then either it's asymptomatic bacteria and they don't need antibiotics, or here's the other kicker, they're immunosuppressed by steroids, Cushing's disease, uh, immunosuppressive agents, so you're decreasing inflammation. Uh, <clears throat> anytime I get bacteria in an inactive sediment, I make sure that dog is not Cushionoid. Okay. But we treat those with an active sediment. All right, and what do we treat? Just right offhand, amoxicillin is a pretty daggum good drug. And not so for the rest of the body. Remember I said there was a lot of resistance out there. But you're talking about concentrating several hundred fold in the urine uh, if uh, there's no renal failure. A confident kidney will concentrate um, uh, beta-lactams, tetracycline, several hundredfold. So we can overcome a lot of resistance. So amoxicillin is a good choice. Now truthfully, more commonly, you'll see here uh, clavamox used for over amoxicillin because they're concerned about penicillinase producing organisms. And I, I don't think that's wrong. Uh, but I will say if I get that culture and sensitivity back, and regular amoxicillin will work, just like I said before. I'm not opposed to switching them and getting and stopping the clavamox. There is a, a, an issue that I'm not going to go into that if you expose bacteria to a beta-lactamase inhibitor, uh, you may actually induce beta-lactamase if, they're, if they uh, are not totally eliminated. So they may start off uh, not producing a beta-lactamase, and then you may actually cause it by using a drug that has one.
Okay. Now, uh, those are easily what we do right offhand. So again, <laughs> say clavamox, and you're pretty good on the UTI. We used to use TMS or methoprim sulfa, basically the same thing, all right, or methoprim sulfadiazine. It used to be our drug of choice, all right, and that's, but that's before we realized <laughs> those five side effects. Uh, now, it's still not bad if you're using it short term, like a week. The risk is pretty minimal that you're going to run into one of those side effects. Um, <clears throat> but it has cut down a lot. We don't use fluoroquinolones as first choices except in a pyelonephritis. Uh, pyelonephritis can be very, um, uh, indeed, life-threatening, very difficult to uh, cure. So we get a little more aggressive with a pyelonephritis than we do with a plain cystitis. So there, we actually may go to a fluoroquinolone right offhand. So that's first choice. <coughs> now, how do we go about this? Again, we perform a culture and susceptibility. Now, in practice, you may not do cultures on first-time UTIs. Here we do, and increasingly, most urologists are saying just culture them, period. We're running into so much resistance these days. Go ahead and culture them, all right? Then you, you pick your best therapy and put them on it while you're awaiting your culture and sensitivity results. And again, I put them on four or five days. Uh, so if I have to change antibiotics based on culture, they, the owner hasn't spent a lot of money uh, on, on a drug they won't use. Uh, <coughs> now, the been on the antibiotics, uh, reculturing, if first time uncomplicated UTI, uh, I might not in practice reculture if they seem to have responded. Definitely on your recurrent UTIs, or if I didn't do a culture the first time, I really prefer to bring them back, especially on your recurrent though. If the antibiotic is working, the urine should be sterile on culture within three days. It still may have some sediment, some blood and some white cells, but it should, the bacteria should be dead, okay? If you're still culturing positive after three or more days of antibiotics, you've got a problem. Either it's the wrong antibiotic, the wrong dose or owner compliance. Something is going on. Either way, you need to address it. All right. Now, uh, how long do we treat UTIs? Y you know, we, we have almost no evidence to direct this. Um, what you're seeing here is a consensus from a task force, an expert committee. That's our best guess. All right. We used to treat first-time uncomplicated UTIs uh, for two weeks. We've reduced that now to one week. Now, this is still longer than humans. It's not uncommon in humans, uh, especially women, for physicians to treat three days. All right. uh, even there were some protocols that were, that were single-dose high antibiotic one time. All right. Why the difference? We don't know. We don't even know if one week is the right time. But I think it kind of boils down to this. If you have a UTI, you're pretty miserable. You know you have a UTI and you're going to seek out a physician to get something for it. These dogs can go a long time before the owners realize something's wrong. They realize, well, they're urinating a lot. Oh, I saw a little blood in the urine these sorts of things. So oftentimes the UTI is much more advanced than it would be in a human. So that's the, the, the reason for the one week recommendation. Admittedly, if I have an animal in ICU and he's got a, a catheter and I pull the catheter and he's positive on culture, then I might not go the whole seven days because I'm catching it really early at that particular point. I might go three or four days. Uh, and see, but typically one week. Uh, and, and that reminds me, on culture, 
there are three ways we culture urine. All right. The ideal is always a cystocentesis. All right. So if you can tap the bladder with a needle and syringe and get your sample, that's the gold standard because anything you grow in that is significant. All right. Now, the second thing we can do is, is, is catheterize them. All right. Now, when I say that, we take our sample on a new clean catheter. So you, you run the catheter through the urethra and you sample. We do not sample from indwelling catheters that have been there. There is a high incidence that that distal catheter will have contaminants in it and you'll get uh, false results. So a freshly catheterized animal, yes. An indwelling uh, that's been there a few days, no, we don't trust those. We'd rather do a cysto. Um, and then lastly, we have voided samples. Uh, <coughs> this is the last resort, but it, it oftentimes is what we use in outpatient scenarios is um, we'll, um, we'll follow the animal. We have literally a cup on a stick uh, that we uh, walk the animal and we follow around trying to catch a urine sample. You want to get a midstream voided sample. The very first of the urine stream is going to have contaminants from the distal urethra. So we want those flushed out and we want to catch a midstream. Now, in the cystocentesis, anything that grows is significant. In the voided sample, we look at the number of bacteria present. And uh, they quantitate in micro the number of bacteria by what they call colony forming units. It's basically one bacteria equates to one colony, although that may not be exact. And the rule is, uh, if you culture 100,000 colony forming bacterial units per mil of urine or more, that's considered to be uh, significant and unlikely to be contaminant. So we can use the numbers in the urine to assess that that's a probable UTI and not a contaminant. All right. So uh, we go uh, one week, and, and uh, this, is, this is uncomplicated. Uh, I'll talk about complicated in a little bit. Recurrent UTIs uh, are first-time prostatitis. Recurrent UTIs, we go four weeks. Uh, anytime we have a prostatitis, regardless of uh, whether it's first time or not, about six weeks. I'll talk about prostatitis in just a moment. All right, so much longer. And pyelonephritis, four to six weeks. Pyelonephritis is a nasty disease. It's really hard to cure. So long-term therapy is usually warranted. Now, after we finish therapy, again, maybe not the first time UTI. That's clinician preference. But definitely any of these others. We finish the antibiotic. We wait a week. And we reculture them to see if they've relapsed. Uh, again, uh, after about three or four days of the antibiotic being out of their system, if they're bacteria present, they will have started to replicate again and you'll have a positive culture. And relapse is a, a, a big, big problem. So uh, we culture initially. If you're concerned about whether you pick the antibiotic that's correct, culture after three days during therapy and then culture at the end after all the antibiotic therapy is done and the antibiotic is out of their system. Okay. Now, as I said, we recurrent UTIs are uh, a big problem for us. Uh, and I kind of, how I uh, work, it depends on if it's the same organism or a different organism because that implies different causes of failure. Uh, if it's the same organism, and, and how do you know it's the same organism, short of a DNA fingerprint? 
I mean, yeah, if you were doing epidemiology, you'd send it off and you look at the DNA and the plasmids and all that. Nobody does that for, uh, uh, in the clinical setting. What you do is, is it the same organism? Is it an E. coli? Is it still a staph? Is it still whatever? And you look at the antibiogram, the antibiotic susceptibilities. Basically, if it's the same organism, it will have the same antibiogram, the same susceptibilities, with the exception that it's now resistant to whatever you've used to treat it. So that uh, indicates it's the same organism. If we have that, then inadequate treatment. Uh, we either we made the wrong selection or we didn't treat long enough. Uh, more commonly, a you know, big problem is urolis, either kidney stones, if it's a pyelonephritis, or bladder stones. Uh, uroliths are, uh, uh, you always hate to say never, but it, it's, it's almost impossible to sterilize a urolith with antibiotics. Uh, you have to get rid of the urolith. Now, struvite uroliths we can dissolve with diet. Uh, SD, some of these diets will dissolve through by Everything else you've got to get rid of them, uh, typically surgery or retropulsion. Uh, I don't know, have you heard retropulsion before? Okay, retropulsion is a technique works best in female uh, dogs because of the short urethra. Basically, you usually anesthetize them. You drain the urine with a catheter, leave the catheter in, fill it with saline, good volume. <coughs> turn the, the bitch uh, where it's standing on its rear leg so the phone stones fall toward the neck of the bladder and then you forcibly squeeze and you're trying to, to squeeze all that urine and flush out the stone then you've got a little strainer uh, there to catch and see if you got the stones or not and then you re-radiograph. If it works it saves you doing a surgery uh, and again in, in the bitch it, it sometimes can but otherwise we have to go in and surgically remove those stones otherwise they'll serve as a nidus of infection. Other things that we run into some of these just have gone on forever oftentimes it's those cases where uh, it's, they've gone from one veterinarian to another veterinarian and so there's no continuity of care and we just have a lot of pathologic damage done to the bladder wall. A lot of fibrosis, a lot of microabscessation uh, that's going to tend to uh, resist cure and uh, relapse. And anatomical abnormalities such as a urethral uh, diverticulum, all right, where you remember the urethra connects the bladder to the umbilicus and normally it um, um, sclerosis, uh, is it the falciform ligament? I can't remember, that's way too long ago. <laughs> but there are urethral diverticula where the, the urethra doesn't close and then you've got a blind pouch that a lot of debris and bacteria and pus can settle into and it's hard to get your antibiotic into those. So that, that's all the same organism. Now if you get a different organism, I'm looking for either anatomical abnormalities predisposing to entry into the urinary tract, like vulvar inversion, these sorts of things that require surgical correction, or more commonly immunosuppressive diseases. Diabetes mellitus and Cushing's are probably the most common, but certainly Im any immunosuppressive therapy, steroids, cyclosporin, all those sorts of things are just going to make the animal more prone to get an infection, and oftentimes these are different organisms. Again, they may be the same e uh, genus, it might be another E. coli. Remember to look at that antibiogram to see if it's the same as the prior isolates with the exception of resistance to the drug you just used. All right. Now prostatitis kind of goes along with this but with some difference and this is primarily a disease of the uh, non-castrated dog. Basically you're not going to see prostatitis in neutered, uh, neutered dogs. Uh, now, uh, you'll be taught how to do prostatic washes and prostatic biopsies. We do those mostly to check for neoplasia, all right? You can get your etiology on a bacterial prostatitis from the bladder. 
if the dial casts prostatitis, there's a very, 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 very good chance he has a cystitis. So you can culture your urine, which is a lot simpler than trying to do a prostatic wash, and that will get you your etiology. The difference here is you've got to have that antibiotic cross the blood prostate barrier. So things, not everything you treat a UTI with can you treat a prostatitis. And here are good empiric choices. Now, if you gram stain it and it's a uh, staph or something, gram positive, yeah, you can use clindamycin or macrolide, but we would only do so if none of these other things uh, were likely to work. These up here, the broad spectrum, uh, tending with good gram negative coverage, uh, tend to be what we prefer. Enrofloxacin or fluoroquinolone is kind of the drug of choice for most uh, prostatitis infections, even first time prostatitis. It penetrates, it's sidle, and it gets everything but streps and anaerobes. Uh, <coughs> so that's a good choice. Uh, Chloramphenicol is a good choice. Trimethoprim sulfa is just a little less. Um, if you've got prostatic abscesses, again, you know the sulfur has some problems with abscessation and pus, so we tend to have to go more toward higher doses and that sort of thing uh, if we use TMS and, and you have uh, your associated side effects. But uh, uh, fluoroquinolone is typically our first choice, and if we can't use that, chloramphenicol or maybe TMS. Um, now, multi-drug resistance, we're getting more and more of these uh, where they've seen, they've been treated multiple times, uh, don't have a lot to work with. Uh, what are some of the things you can do? Well, if you're going to use any of these things, you're not likely to use a macrolide, but you are fairly likely to use a fluoroquinolone. And as a last resort, you might use an aminoglycoside. Again, they're nephrotoxic, so we don't use them routinely, but I have had one or two cases where dead gummit, just everything else was, uh, wouldn't work. It was resistant to everything except amicacin. Any of those, it will help if, um, <coughs> uh, that says acidification, oh yeah, acidification except for those three. Those three, you want a neutral to alkaline. Uh, acidification may particularly help with the beta-lactams. If you're using a beta-lactam, will acidify. What are some of the other things? I mentioned to you nitrofuran toin and nitrofuran. Uh, again, used a lot in human medicine, but not much in veterinary medicine. And this is not on the routine panel. So you have to ask micro to run nitrofuran toin for you. Uh, but a lot of times it will come back susceptible when other things are resistant. Suffixum is a human oral third generation uh, that has been used. Uh, uh, Cephidoxime has probably replaced that, Simplicef. Cephobacin is convenia. Uh, that's the one shot, lasts a week to two weeks. Um, um, we use that, again, mostly when owner compliance is a problem. I don't like to use it routinely, but if it tests susceptible, I'll use it. Or if the owner compliance is not good, then we get around that. Chloramphenicol we use based on culture. Uh, again, it's a good choice for the enterococci, okay? And you don't have to know doses, that's just for you. That's left over from um, practitioner talk. Phosphomycin is the one I mentioned. It's kind of a unique class human product. It comes in the little powder to be dissolved in water, a glass of water and taken. And again, the problem is getting the, the, the liquid down the dog. But if you can, uh, it can be very effective. And again, spectinomycin is out there. It requires injection as the drawback. But if you happen to get a susceptibility, uh, it, it may be something you can use instead of an aminoglycoside uh, that doesn't have the toxicity. So all of these are based on culture and susceptibilities. Uh, um, 
I wouldn't routinely say this is empiric when we reach a multi-drug resistant infection. There you definitely want uh, culture and susceptibilities. And this just makes the point I was alluding to earlier that uh, we have the ability to concentrate certain drugs in the urine. So up here we've got Oxytet 333 times uh, more in the urine than plasma. Here's amoxicillin at 211 times, so on and so forth. Even the ones that, that don't really go into the urine abundantly, they're removed by the, the liver, still reach therapeutic concentrations. Chloramphenicol, uh, seven times as much in the, the urine uh, as the plasma, clindamycin twice as much. So we can use this. Now, this is in non-renal failure patients. All right. If you have a renal failure patient, that complicates your, your drug selection. All right. The renal failure patient is isostenuric. He cannot concentrate his urine, which means he cannot concentrate these antibiotics. So when you have a renal failure patient, you do not use your urine culture results. There are special urine panels in small animal that have like seven drugs that uh, are listed. But those are based on higher breakpoints because they concentrate in urine. If it's a renal failure, you need to be looking at the standard panel based on plasma concentrations. In a renal failure patient, the concentrations in the urine mimic plasma. All right. The other drawback on renal failures is because they don't concentrate, you don't get that bacteriostatic effect that concentrated urine provides. Normal concentrated urine is somewhat bacteriostatic on its own. And in the isostenuric patient, you lose that. So renal failure complicates it. We have to treat it based on plasma concentration susceptibility criteria, not on urine concentration susceptibility. <clears throat> Let me see if I can uh, uh, get through this. There are those cases where we just give up curing them. That we've treated them, you know, five times, ten times. They've been through multiple vets usually. What do you do? Well, one, you can use once a day therapy. And you pick your antibiotic based on culture and sensitivity. You give a single dose and instead of the uh, aggressive dose to hold them in remission. Nitrofurin toin is a good example there. Normally we would dose that TID to QID. Uh, in this scenario, in Dr. Osborne, who's kind of a guru of your, uh, renal uh, disease and vet med, uh, he'll dose this once a day, he gives it to the dog before bedtime, it goes into the urine, it sits in the bladder overnight, and the dog gets out and urinates the next morning and it's gone. It won't cure it, but it oftentimes will hold it in remission. Now eventually, if he lives long enough, you may have to change that based on uh, developed resistance. But usually these are older dogs with multiple health problems and their life expectancy is not all that long. Then lastly, one I talked to you about, methenamine, not to be confused with methionine. Methionine is a urinary tract antiseptic, but methenamine is a urine, excuse me, methionine is urinary tract acidifier, but methenamine is an antiseptic. Uh, again, you don't have to know doses. Again, it, you must acidify the urine. It will not work otherwise. Uh, and because that conversion to formaldehyde is time dependent, it will only work for cystitis, uh, not a pyelonephritis. I use it um, upon occasion in uh, spinal dogs with uh, spinal bladders. <laughs> and uh, I'm doing so because of this addition here, cephalexin. Uh, we're never too old to learn, and I was at a meeting in Phoenix in January, and this topic came up. There is evidence that cephalexin concentrates so highly in urine that it can be effective even against E. coli UTIs. So cephalexin, though you would not use it for a gram negative in any other situation, uh, it would be appropriate for either staph or E. coli uh, UTIs 
as an option. Still probably amoxicillin or clavamox would be the most common, but cephalexin would be a, um, an alternative that I wanted to mention that wasn't in the, uh, the notes. Okay, so back to where we left off. Again, talking about UTIs. Fungal UTIs luckily are relatively rare. Um, the systemic mycosis most likely to be seen is a renal aspergillosis. Now that's not a good thing because we have so few things that can treat aspergillus. Uh, before we had voriconazole, we would try fluconazole. Remember of the three, keto, itra, and flu, flu is the only one that goes into the urine. Well, boriconazole goes into the urine too, and it has activity against aspergillus. So that would be what we would opt for now would be boriconazole. Uh, you can have yeast infections of the uh, UTI, both uh, renal and um, bladder. Uh, <coughs> Again, either flu or voriconazole would work. You're probably going to use fluconazole here. The yeast in veterinary medicine have remained susceptible to it. In human medicine, that's, that can be another story. But a fluconazole enters the urine and would be probably your treatment of choice in a, uh, a yeast UTI. I mentioned the statin infusions uh, with the parentheses that is the last resort. Um, where this is probably most likely to be done would be in a horse or a foal with a candidal uh, cystitis where you can't afford to give fluconazole. Uh, you can catheterize the animal and infuse nystatin. It's a last resort, one, because it may require multiple treatments, and the reason that's bad is that every time you catheterize an animal, you risk taking something in with you to cause an iatrogenic infection. So we try to minimize catheterization whenever possible. So uh, again, the statin infusions would be a last resort sort of scenario. I would consider fluconazole as your treatment of choice for a candidal UTI.